week two of this series, and today I've called my message The Groaning of Creation. Last week, we heard from Dave Lazenby, the associate pastor at Newton Mearns Baptist Church, um, and Dave was introducing the whole series that we live in a wonderful world that God has made. It's beautiful. It's been made by God. It reflects God's goodness, God's glory, but we are here for a special reason. We've been created by God for a reason. I'm going to get into a little bit of that this morning. But first of all, I have to show you two very disturbing pictures. Okay, here's the first, first one. So look carefully at that. That is obviously taken from my office window, looking over the car park at a council worker from um, Glasgow City Council. And you have to look really careful to you see what he's doing and why it's disturbing. Can you see? That, we get two collection, two pickups every week, one on a Monday and one on a Thursday. And we've had all kinds of problems with the council over this uh, because they weren't picking up our rubbish. So now what they've decided to do is pick up both on the same day, two days a week. So he's putting the black bin, which is the main rubbish, and the recycling into the same truck. Even worse than that, about three weeks ago, um, I couldn't believe this, I pulled into the car park, and on the th um, <clears throat> uh, one of these workers came. He opened up our black bin, and there was only one little bag in it. So he reached into the black bin and pulled the rubbish out of the black bin and put it in the recycling and then put the recycling in with the general rubbish. I was so angry. I'm so annoyed. I'm thinking, I mean, especially if Rena McClellan had seen that, she would be doing her own single-handed protest because Rena is very, very meticulous and careful about making sure as a church we separate all our recycling. Well, the council according to this, don't really care if we, we do it or not. Here's the second one that someone sent me yesterday. This is a church in Glasgow who put this up last week. In case you can't see, it's a wee bit blurry. I've had to make, put it up a wee bit. The world, world's most urgent need is churches preaching Christ crucified, not climate change. And I don't mind mentioning, but that's the Tron Church in the center of Glasgow. And if you have a problem with that, we'll talk about it afterwards, but I have a major problem with that. And if you don't, then we really need to talk. And hopefully in my message today, you're going to see why that is actually awful. A terrible statement to put up in the light of where we are at the moment as a world and with the world coming to Glasgow to look at how we can change our world. So I was really disturbed by those. I'm going to come back to this passage a little bit later on. It's in Romans chapter 8. And in the NIV, it reads, We know that the whole of creation is groaning in the pains of childbirth. But that's not exactly what it's saying in Romans 8. It's saying this, We know that the whole of creation is groaning together and is travailing together in labor pains right up to the present time. So let's look at that again. The whole of creation is groaning, and, and the word there is this deep, deep sigh, okay? Like, you know, when something is just weighing on you so heavy, you know what that feels like. This deep groan comes out of you. Okay, when I saw a couple of those pictures, I had a bit of a groan. Okay, but notice it says something, and again, you don't see this in the NIV, and this is where Bible translators get a bit too clever and they miss something. These two words says they're groaning together. Together with what? Well, I'm going to tell you that in a while. So it's not just the creation is groaning and it's travailing like it's in labor, but it's in labor with something else or someone else. And that's really, really important. So please keep that in mind. I'm not going to tell you what it is right up to this present time. So the question is, what's gone wrong between last week with Dave Lazenby's message and this week? Last week, we had all these wonderful pictures of creation and all the beauty of creation from birds to animals to mountains to rivers that God has made. And with this, what's gone wrong and why is creation groaning? 
First of all, I want to address a couple of challenges, <clears throat> and I, I feel I really need to do this. I was going to cut this part out of the message, but I thought, no, do it, because I've thought about these things, and maybe some of you have. Many people blame Christianity in our country or blame religion in general. And back in the 20th century, there was this really famous uh, academic called Arnold Townby. You may not have heard of him, but you'll know his granddaughter, Polly Townby, who was a BBC journalist. Arnold Townby was like the greatest academic in his era, talking about the world, but he was very negative about religion, and he used to write books putting down Christianity and other religions too, particularly for what they were doing or not doing for the world. And so, is Christianity to blame or religion? First of all, yes, partly. Partly we are. If you go through history and you look back in the past and you see the times where Christians should speak out and should be active and were silent, yes, we have been silent. Or other times where we should have been silent, where we should have held back, but we did things and we, we cooperated with societies that was doing things, um, yes, we did. So we're not going to get off the hook okay? As Christians, and I'm talking about Christians in the broadest sense of the world here, okay? Maybe you say, well, I'm not like that. Okay, but generally speaking, over the course of history, Christians have, have not acted the way they should, particularly towards God's creation, okay? And so there's a need for confession. There's a need for us to say, hands up, I haven't done what I'm supposed to have done, or hands up, I shouldn't have done that, okay? And we need to repent for that, so we're not getting off the hook completely, but Townby and these other people have a real go at Christians based upon things we believe. And I'm going to mention this one in just a wee minute. First of all, we have a wrong understanding about the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, Christians have used Genesis chapter 1 and certain statements in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 to justify what they have done to the planet. And I'll come on to that in just a wee minute, okay? But that is not so much, that's a wrong understanding. That's not because the Bible has said that. It's because people have misread the Bible. There's lots of things that Christians have done over the course of time, not because the Bible tells them to do it, but because of their own reading of the Bible or misreading of the Bible. So first of all, um, <clears throat> we want to challenge that. Secondly, the incarnation is what we use, what we talk about when we talk about Jesus coming, God becoming human. And over the course of time, um, <clears throat> there's been a very wrong understanding about um, <clears throat> our world and our place in our world, to the point where we've separated our body from the soul. You may have heard this, that, you know, God is, we, we have a soul in our body. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Bible doesn't say that you have a body and a soul. It says you are a living soul. You are a soul. A soul is not part of you that leaves you when you die. It's part and we are whole living beings. Secondly, we've separated the material from the spiritual as though the material doesn't matter. It's only the spiritual that counts, which is my main challenge with that earlier picture from that church in Glasgow. The world and the material parts of the world don't matter and don't matter to God. The only thing that matters to God is your spirit or your soul are getting saved. And that is a gross misrepresentation of what the Bible says. And when Jesus became human and entered this physical planet and walked on it and ate food and slept and got in boats and made friends and wore clothes and worked at a carpenter's bench, he was not just coming to do that in order to die for us. He was coming to do that to say, matter matters to God. Your bodies matter to God. This world matters to God because Jesus came and became like us and lived in this world. And it's also a misunderstanding of the future, but we'll come on to that in a minute. Separating of heavenly things and earthly things. And finally, another theological word, but now let me just put it up anyway. This means the end time, the doctrine of the end. We have a wrong understanding of the end. Many people think that this world will eventually be destroyed based on only one verse in the entire Bible, 2 Peter 3 verse 10. 2 Peter 3 verse 10 does talk about a burning 
But the word that's used there, and this is again why we have to be very, very careful how we read our Bibles. Because if we don't read them carefully, people like Toynbee and others will criticize us for what they think the Bible is actually saying. The word that's used in there is the Greek word pure-o, which we get the word purify. So what it says he's saying is, yes, there will be a burning, but it's a purifying burning. It's the burning that takes place when you get rid of rubbish, when you get rid of bad things and, and destroy them. That's what it's saying. And if you read the passage again very carefully, it doesn't say it's people. It doesn't say it's the planet. Some Christians have even taken 2 Peter 3.10 to talk about global warming and say 2 Peter 3.10 is talking about global warming, that the world's going to burn up. It's got nothing to do with global warming, nothing. Okay? And it's not justifying global warming. There are some American Christians who say, let global warming get worse, because the Bible says eventually the world's going to burn up and destroy. Shocking interpretation and shocking attitudes. So it talks about sinful behaviors are going to burn up. It talks about the things that human beings do that are cruel and sinful and destructive and harmful. That's what God will burn up. That's what God will get rid of and purify this world from all the bad things and attitudes and actions, and He will then make a new world where righteousness, where good things live. But again, if we read that verse wrongly, we will think that's what's going to happen. And by the way, if you read the end of the Bible, we don't go anywhere, okay? Some heaven comes to us. That's for another topic another day. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Here's one of those verses that people have used um, wrongly. In Genesis 1.26, it says, Then God said, Let us make Adam in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over birds of the air, fish of the sea, animals, etc. And then in verse 28, it's repeated again. God blessed them, humans, and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over it. Now, some of you that grew up with the King James Version of the Bible will maybe remember this word, but in the old English translations, instead of saying rule over, you remember what word they used? Anyone remember that? Dominion. It says, let them have dominion over them. And you say, well, that sounds pretty oppressive, Don. I mean, to have dominion over something, that sounds just like you're going to like trample it and put it down. But again, read the Bible carefully. To have dominion doesn't mean domination. In the Old Testament, the kings of Israel were told to have dominion. And in one of the Psalms, Psalm 72, he says, a good king will rule over the people or have dominion over the people by caring for them, by, by, by looking out for their justice, by not letting evil triumph, by, 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 sacrifice, by giving of himself for others. So to have dominion and to rule over something properly is to do it the way God does. That's what it's saying. We are here on this planet as God's representatives. And when we rule and when we exercise dominion, it's to be done in the way God exercises dominion, not the way humans do it. Because when humans are set free, they destroy our planet and have dominion. The other thing is, we have to have dominion the way Jesus does. How did Jesus rule? Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God and talk about the kingdom of God, and people followed him. But what kind of ruler was Jesus? How did Jesus exercise his dominion over his disciples? How did he exercise dominion over his enemies? How did he exercise dominion over people who were blind or had leprosy or, or were suffering or were excluded? He had compassion. That's the way Jesus exercised dominion. He came alongside people and he healed them and restored them and got rid of the forces of darkness and evil that were oppressing them. So 
This passage, yes, says that we have to rule, but how do we do it? We do it as God does it. And by the way, subdue basically means the world won't cooperate with you sometime when you try to do it. Not because God's fighting against you, but the forces of this world will fight against you when you try to rule as God does. Why are we here? Second, Genesis 2, the next passage. This explains a little bit more about what our role is in the world. The Lord God took Adam again and put him in the Garden of Eden, where Eden means something pleasurable or delightful. He put him in there to do what? To work it and take care of it. That's according again to the NIV. King James says to dress it and keep it. New American says to cultivate it and tend it. New living to tend it and watch over it. So what do these words mean? Why are we here? The Hebrew word for work is the word abad, which means to serve. So we are on this planet to serve it. We are servants. Even the fact we are slaves in the sense that we are here uh, at the duty of our planet to serve it and to care for it the way um, someone would serve someone who's suffering, the way Jesus said, I am among you to serve. Okay, I'm not here to rule. I'm here to serve. And he demonstrated that not just by washing their feet in that act at the end of his life, but through his whole ministry. Everyone he met, he served them. He came down to their level as the king of heaven to serve them. And we, when we care for God's world, we're here to serve our world. And secondly, to take care of it is the Hebrew word shamar, which means protect or guard. And if you go to North America, most North American cities, the police cars will have this on the side of them, to serve and protect. I think Canada does as well, actually, if I remember right. To serve and protect. Okay? It's as though God has written that in our hearts. Why are we here? Why are we on this planet? Why do you exist here? Not just to take, not just to live for yourself, but you and I are on this planet, according to the Bible, to serve and guard and protect it. And as human beings, we haven't done a very good job of that. And we're going to come on just a moment to see how we can do that. Okay, so if that's why we're here, to serve and protect God's world, why haven't we done it? Simply because we have a choice. We've all got choices. And then this wonderful picture at the start of creation, it says, you know, strength, and again, let's not get in conversations about literalism and was there two trees and what was it exactly a tree, what type of tree, all that sort of stuff. Okay, the Bible in that passage is trying to paint a picture for us of, of, of life as God wants life to be lived. It says, imagine these two trees, and one of these trees was life-giving, and you can just spend all your time enjoying the fruit of this tree and living as God wants you to live, okay? And just trusting and working with God. Or another tree, uh, and this tree often confuses me because you think, well, does God not want us to know good from evil? It's not that he doesn't want us to know, but he doesn't want us to know evil, that's what he's saying. He says, once you eat that tree, it's not just you're going to have good things, you're going to have evil things too. Do you want those evil things? Do you want to, as it were, eat those evil things? No. He says, that's not why I'm having you here. But of course, the story is they couldn't resist. They ate of the fruit of the tree. Their eyes were opened, and they started to experience good and evil. And as a result of that story in Genesis, here's what the Bible says. This is really important. Again, talking to Adam, human beings. Then to Adam, God says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. And so that picture at the start of the Bible is saying, the reason why our world is in a mess the reason why our world, our planet, doesn't cooperate is actually because of us. We have done things. We have turned away from God, and instead of 
serving and cultivating and blessing and guarding and protecting and bringing all the goodness of this world, which we are here to do, we've actually cooperated with all the bad forces and allowed them to ravage this world unchecked to the point of where we are today. The word curse, in case you worry about that, it, it basically means deprive or, or, or to hold back. It's the opposite of blessing. You know, Genesis 1, God bless this world. God bless human beings. Genesis 3, we see the opposite. So that's why, because we all have choices. Just as Adam and Eve, right down to this day, we live in each day of our lives between these two trees, metaphorically speaking. We can choose one, we can choose the other. So what's wrong with this world? We are. We're what's wrong with this world. So let's go back. Oh, let me just put this up. Um, <clears throat> if you want evidence that we're to blame, I think this slide, and there's all kinds of versions of this that you can find on the internet. Okay, this is the last 2,000 years. So there's human time at the bottom from the year zero to the year 2021, approximately, okay? And here at the end is the amount of emissions of dangerous gases. Those are the three most common ones, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, the gases. Have a look at that graph. When did things start to change? Okay, and look how quickly things changed. Why? Because between 1760 and 1840, we started the Industrial Revolution. In the, in the 1760s, um, inventors started inventing all of these machines. So instead of people doing the farming, machines would do the farming. Instead of people making clothes from all the cotton that came across from America, machines would make the clothes. Instead of us walking places, machines would take us to places. And that changed radically human beings. Now, our life expectancy got longer, but so did the pollution. So did the injustice. The rich got richer, but also people got a lot poorer as well because they were used in the factories. And so I want to ask the question, if we're created to serve and protect this world, how have we done in the last couple of hundred years? And this is why we are at the stage where we're at right now, where because of our actions and our continued actions, and by the way, I was having this conversation in the car park last week with someone, before we blame China too much, China's only doing what we started. The Chinese are saying, we're doing what you guys have been doing for 200 years, so it's our turn to do it now. And that's not to get them off the hook, okay? But we need to get away from thinking it's their fault in China and Russia and India and the, the developing world. For 200 years, we've been doing a pretty good job of destroying this planet. And so we're all in this together. And so, as we conclude, Creation, Romans 8, is in, waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice. There's that sense again. Why is the creation groaning? Not because it chose to, okay? But it was subjected to it by the will of the one who subjected it in the hope that the creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know the whole creation is groaning together right up to the present time. So what's Romans 8 saying? It's simply saying this. We are to blame. We are the ones who've done this, okay? And when God sent Jesus into the world, he didn't just come to save your soul. He didn't come to take you away from a dying planet to a place called heaven one day, and you could wave goodbye to a planet that was being destroyed. That is not the message of the Bible. Jesus came to this planet to save human beings so that through human beings working with God, he could save this planet. That's the gospel. And that's why that sentence at the beginning is so offensive. God loves this world. He loves you, but God loves trees and birds, and plants, and fish, and dolphins, and mountains, and rivers. God loves this world. God sent Jesus in this world to save us, 
And if you read all of Romans 8, we won't have time to go into it today. It says, as we are saved, as we are changed, so the planet gets changed. I want to finish with this. Uh, some of you know this week I went over to visit uh, my mom and dad in Belfast. And I was on a bus on Monday morning, and the bus was driving through the center of Belfast. And quickly, I saw this picture of this cathedral church. And I got my phone out, and I managed to capture it between the two trees, interestingly. See, the cross and the center of the cross is a circle. That's St. Anne's Cathedral in Belfast. Okay, what is that speaking of? That cross with a, a circle around it is an ancient Celtic symbol. And Adrian Smith was mentioning this in the prayer meeting last Sunday morning as we were praying. The Celtic Christians, the first Christians in this country before the rest took over, were people who cared about this world. And when they brought Christianity, the cross, to this world, okay, it wasn't just a cross, but they made pictures and, 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 and models of the cross with a circle around it. What does the circle represent? The world. So they saw the cross at the center of the world. They saw that the cross had come not just to heal people, but to heal the world. And the early Christians who lived in this world, this country that we live, you know, including um, Mongo who came here, wanted to save the world, the planet. That's the first one. The second one is good old St. Francis. There he is in a very modern way. Okay? Why did I put him up? Because when Francis was here in this world, in the times of the Crusades, St. Francis was concerned for all of God's world. He looked to the moon and the sun and the creatures of the ground as his brothers and sisters. He was grateful to God for them, and he prayed for them, okay? And the Franciscans are, are even to this day, are ones who are at the forefront of some of the, the, the ways that we can care for our planet. And so what are, the, what are the things that we can take away from this today? Simply this, God saved us and is saving us so that together, so the suffering together, the groaning together is with who? It's with you. It's with me. When we suffer, when we groan, we are groaning with this planet. God saved us so that he might save the world. So think about these things as you go, as you leave today, as I'm going to. What are some of the ways I've maybe misread my Bible? Okay, have I been guilty of that? What ways am I serving and protecting my world? I'm not going to go into it. You can go on the one show. Last week on the one show, the 20 really good ideas that you and I can do, and it's on iPlayer, for our planet. Pick one. Let's pick one and do it. And then finally, praying and working. That's what Francis did, praying and working. Praying with the Spirit who's going to change this world and working with God so that our world will be what it's supposed to be in the hope and expectation one day that Jesus is coming. And so now, Lord, as we move into a time of communion, and as we take this bread, and as we take this wine, as we take this wafer and this wine, help us not just to think about ourselves, that you've saved me. But Lord, as we take communion today, help us to realize that the cross is at the center of the world. That the cross has come not just to save Don and me, but it's to save the world that I live in. And as I take this bread and wine today, Lord, help me to realize that I'm leaving this place today with your, you inside me to make a difference. I'm here to pray, and I'm here to work, I'm here to serve, and I'm here to protect. And as we take this, help us to look in ways that we can actually do that this week so that our world will be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.